Quite a while back, I made a community post looking for some questions for an Optiplex-related Q&A. And you guys really responded. I got a lot more questions than I was expecting, but I also wasn't expecting to be headed to the emergency room shortly after making that post. I don't really want to get into it, but it's the reason for the delay, and if you're curious, I've talked about what's going on on my community page. Anyways, I'm not feeling even like 50%, but I'm determined to get this filmed, and like I said, there were a lot of questions, so I'm going to break this up into three parts because I want to get to all of them. Speaking of which, let's get into it. So our first question is actually from a couple of people wanting to know about how long these systems will be viable and when the 4th gen will start bottlenecking higher end GPUs. Okay, so I want to answer the second half first. Now, it's bottlenecking them right now. And if you watched my CPU comparison video, you saw that I paired the 1080 Ti with the 4790. And it was bottlenecking it at 1080p. I mean, using Far Cry 5 as an example, the 1080 Ti's results might as well have been the 1080. And let's be honest here. The 1080 Ti isn't even a high-end GPU anymore, is it? Even the 3060 Ti is noticeably faster in a lot of games. We might have to wait for the bog standard 3060 to consistently get down to 1080 Ti levels here. So forget about the 6800 XT or the 3080. You're going to bottleneck either at 1080p and even 1440p. Now 4K? That's still a question, one that I'd love to test out, but that's not happening anytime soon for obvious reasons, and ain't nobody sending me either for view or testing. As to the first part of the question, it's hard to say, mainly because we're seeing some badly needed competition out of AMD, and I don't think a lot of people expected to see them hit both Intel and Nvidia as hard and as fast as they have. Also, the new consoles have proper CPUs in them. They have 8 actual cores, so expect console ports to the PC to be optimized around 8 cores going forward. It could take time for that to really start to be prolific, but I wouldn't expect 5 years out of the 4th gen i7s, at least not for new AAA titles. I feel like I'm being optimistic saying two to three years max, but take that with a grain of salt. That's purely speculative and I don't have some inside information. That's merely a guess based on how things are trending right now. And now we have quite a few about installing newer motherboards in an Optiplex as well as putting newer CPUs in existing Opti hardware. The first part of that's easy. The Opti mini tower cases are standard micro ATX, so any micro ATX board will drop right in. No problem. The problem is getting everything on the front panel to function. That's going to require some custom work, and I'd say you're better off getting a new case. There are some really good options in the $50 range with tempered glass side panels, better airflow, better cable management, better layouts, and they actually look better too. But I mean, if you just want to make a sleeper or something, that'd actually be cool. So. Just know that it's going to require some custom work to get some things to function. The CPU half of this is also simple, as in, no. Um, for starters, AMD and Intel CPUs aren't interchangeable. Intel CPUs use LGA or Land Grid Array. They have pads on the bottom of the CPU and the pins are in the socket, where AMD's desktop CPUs use PGA or Pin Grid Array. They have pins on the bottom of the CPU, and inside the socket there are these little fingers that kind of go around the pins when you latch the socket closed. Then you have to account for physical size differences. Different pin counts, pins in different locations doing different things, and barring all of that, the BIOS and the chipset have no clue how to talk to those CPUs. Trying to put an AMD CPU in an Intel socket would be devastating. And well, you can put an Intel CPU on an AMD socket, but there's nothing for it to connect to. For a new Intel CPU, you're really dealing with pretty much the same issues. Even if they're the exact same socket, don't expect more than one to two CPU generations per chipset. Now, one of those questions also asked about what GPU is needed to game at 1440p or 4K at 80 to 100 FPS at least. Well, hopefully you have a 4th gen i7 or newer. Even then, it really just depends on the game. The 1080 Ti will be enough to get you in that range for a lot of games at 1440p, some with compromises to settings. Newer games, and you might need something with more horsepower, but I have my doubts that it wouldn't bottleneck a 2080 Ti in some games even at 1440p, though it might still be enough to get you over that 80 FPS mark. 4K, you'd need even more GPU to get that 80 FPS, and regardless, 
There's gonna be some games that just can't really manage that without some settings compromises, like Cyberpunk 2077 is a great example. So there are a lot of variables and it's really impossible for me to give you a universal answer. All right, so we got another GPU question here. Will a GT 1030 boost its performance? Yeah, pretty much. And I can only assume the reference point is the integrated HD graphics in these Intel CPUs. If not, well, then I don't know what you're comparing it to, but I'll just assume that's what you meant. And that being the case, any somewhat recent GPU is gonna be a huge improvement over the integrated graphics in these CPUs. All right, next up. If I didn't want to remove the hard drive caddy, what GPU would you recommend? Really anything under about nine and a half inches. I've even seen people get like 10 inch GPUs in, but it really depends on the shroud design. Some models even have the power connections at the end of the card rather than on the side where it would normally be. But if you're looking for some suggestions, um, there are a lot of single fan cards out there, but most have terrible coolers. I really like the uh, dual fan EVGA 16 series cards. Uh, the, Mo the, the Zotec Mini is a great choice. Uh, also the Asus Duel. On the AMD side, the ASUS Strix 470 and 570, as well as a bunch of the XFX cards. Um, also the MSI Armor 470 and 570, the, the Mark I cards, the uh, white and black ones, uh, they also fit pretty well. Uh, just keep in mind that the hard drive cage isn't your only obstacle. You have cables back there that can make it a pain, and if you have the SATA and USB 3 ports to contend with, and that'll limit you to 8.5 inches unless you get some low profile cables. Also, be careful when you're trying to slot that card in because you're going to have to go in at an angle and you have a chance that you could hit the board with the GPU's I.O. plate, which could cause some real problems. Hmm. Try to make a homemade 8-pin power supply cable for the motherboard. Nah, nah. I'm, I mean, I sleeved the 8-pin adapter on my test bench here, but that was just so I could make it look good, and the problem is that it has a voltage converter in the middle of the adapter. So to make your own, you'd either have to source one of these or make one yourself. And when these things cost a whopping $12 to $15, you might as well just buy one. How can you upgrade the Optiplex 5040i5 power supply to 500 watts or more for a 1070 for rendering and gaming? First things first, I wouldn't really suggest running a 1070 on a 6th gen i5 for gaming. If you can, I'd upgrade to the i7-6700, which would also help with your rendering. That being said, the 5040 uses a TFX power supply that's 240 watts, and there aren't a lot of good options in the TFX form factor, at least not over about 300 watts, and the best one being the small form factor Dell XE2. It's a 315 watt unit that uses a 6-pin PCIe power connection, as well as the same main 8-pin power connection on the motherboard. So you could run something like a 1660 Ti, which is comparable to the 1070 in terms of gaming performance, but it does have two less gigs of VRAM. So if that matters for your rendering, then you might need the 1070, in which case your best option is an SFX power supply. You'll only be able to get maybe one screw to hold it in at the back, and it may not look nice, but it would work. Are there any risks upgrading the power supply with those 24 to 6 pin adapters? Is there anything I need to look out for when installing the power supply this way? So for those of you who don't know, after the 40 series, on some smaller systems as well, Dell used a 6 pin power connection, though I think the latest systems might be using the 12 VO standard. Anyways, as far as I know, there's no voltage conversion going on in the 6 pin adapter. It's just straight through. So there's less to go wrong. Um, than with the 8 pins, but you can still have poor quality control, so things like bad crimps and getting the leads on the wrong terminal, which was something that happened early on with the few 8 pin adapters. If you're looking for a suggestion, you can't go wrong with the mod DIY adapter. Just keep in mind that it ships out of China, so it could take a while to get to you. And I'll leave a link to that cable down below. Okay, so this is one I've talked about a couple of times in videos, but can you use an RX 570 on the stock 20 series 290 watt power supply? Short answer, I wouldn't. 
The long answer is that I've found that there might be models that do, but the couple that I've tested are a no-go. The MSI Armor Mark II ran, but it was pulling enough power on the 12 volt rails that I wouldn't suggest it. I've also tested the Sapphire Nitro Plus, and the full system was pulling around 300 watts from the walls, so definitely no. However, I've done some preliminary testing on an ASUS Strix 470 um, that I actually have sitting on a test bench right over there, but it seems to be consuming about as much as a 1066 gig model. Granted, it's lower clocked uh, as far as 470s goes, thus it consumes less power. Could that be the case with the 570 version? Well, maybe. It's possible there might be some lower clocked 570s that'd be fine, but I haven't tested any, so I can't say for sure. And the Polaris cards seem to be all over the place in terms of power consumption. So I just say err on the side of caution and just upgrade the power supply. And if you get a good one, they can last several builds. All right, our next question wants to know, would it be worth it to upgrade the CPU in my 7020 from an i5-4690 to a 4790K? Would it be enough for next-gen games, or should I just save my money and build a new one from scratch? Well, if you've got the money, or you can get enough in a reasonable amount of time, i just build a new system. But if you'd rather not, or you can't, I honestly think that upgrading from the i5 to any one of the i7s is going to be a good move going forward. As for getting the 4790K over the 4790, well, I've been doing some testing on this and it's going to be one of the next two videos that I upload, so I don't want to really give away the results. I'll just simply say that it works and the performance uplift, well, that depends, so turn on your notifications to see when that drops. Okay, so this next question is a really good one, but it's going to take a little time. But how do you compare a budget new PC build versus a secondhand Optiplex in terms of performance, value, part durability, and upgrade paths? Now, I want to try to keep this as close to an apples to apples comparison as I can. So I'm looking at something with a fourth gen i7, 16 gigs of RAM, and a decent sized hard drive. Then add an SSD for the boot drive and a 1660 Ti since it's the best GPU we can add with the stock PSU. And all that should cost around 500 bucks, give or take. And I use the air quotes because prices are pretty volatile right now. So I'm just using prices that these things should be selling for. But anyways, I went over to PC Part Picker to come up with a new build, and this is what I came up with. And I know, you're thinking I could have saved money in a lot of places. And you're not wrong, but I'll tell you why I went this route in a minute. Anyways, I also did a second build where I cut every possible corner to see if I could do it with the 1660 Ti. And spoiler alert, I couldn't. And I tell you, don't build this. This system is not worth building for several reasons, which I'll also go over a little later. Anyhow, taking all of this into account, I've got to give performance to the Opti. It's faster out of the box for a similar amount of money. It's just got price to performance in the bag. And that can be said of other OEM systems. And since it's better priced performance, that must mean that it's a better value, right? Wrong. Well, more that I think these two options are for two different people, and value isn't a constant. What's a better value changes from person to person, so if all you can spend right now is around $500, that's it. You won't have anything more to spend in the foreseeable future. The Opti is the better value for you, because it's faster right now. On the flip side, if you have about 500 to spend right now, in a couple of months, you could drop some more cash on a GPU. The new system is the better value for you since the 3400G is passable until you can add in a new GPU. So I have to give value to both. Now, parts durability. Just statistically speaking, it has to go to new. New parts are just less likely to fail than used parts. However, I don't want to give you the idea that that means that parts can't fail soon after you start using them. They can. I also don't want to make you think that used parts are really likely to fail, because they're not. Regardless though, this has to go to new parts. Lastly, upgrade path. This one seems obvious. New, right? Well, the Opti is kind of at the end of its rope. There are a lot of things that we can upgrade, but there's only so far we can upgrade the GPU before we're going to hit a wall. And at that point, we can't upgrade the CPU any further to deal with it. However, with the new system, there's a lot that we can do. And this is the main reason I went with the parts I did. 
The 3400G is a passable gaming experience, and it'll beat a 4790 in every regard. But if you need more CPU, the board is good enough to easily deal with a Zen 3 Ryzen 7 if you wanted to. You have a decent kit of memory with good speeds that won't really hold you back. You've got a good case with decent airflow, cable management, and it looks pretty good too. Then you've got a decent power supply that will be good enough for a 37 or a 6800. But you might need more wattage going beyond that, so it should go without saying the new system easily takes upgrade path. But let's go back to the system I told you not to build for a second. I didn't come close on price, and you'd make so many compromises that weren't worth making because you'd have an A320 board. Forget running a Zen 3 CPU in that. Hell, it might even hold back a Zen 2 Ryzen 7 because they have a less than stellar VRM package. And that's putting it lightly. You have slow RAM, which is going to hold back the CPU, and the case probably has the structural integrity of a wet noodle. And I can only imagine what cable management and airflow are like. And the power supply? Well, it's not going to be good for anything much more than the hardware we have in this configuration. So going this route leaves you with no real upgrade path, so I reiterate, don't build this system. So in the end, which one is better depends on you and your situation. Like I said in value, go with the OEM build route if you're looking to spend as little money as possible to maximize your performance right now. Going with new is the better option if you've got the money to spend to get the GPU in the near future and you're willing to deal with 3400G's limitations until you can. Anyways, I hope I didn't go too far off on a tangent here, but that's what timestamps are for. And this is another one I've tested extensively in some other videos, but is the 4th Gen i5 a good match with the 6 gig 1060? If it were upgraded to an i7, could more of the GPU be used, or would there be bottlenecks? So I've used 6 gig 1060 models on a lot of systems, and I feel they're a decent pairing. Now, I've done a few videos that would give you an idea, but it's really all situational. Yes, there are games where you're going to have pretty high CPU usage, especially in online multiplayer. And well, upgrading to an i7 would eliminate that problem. However, I never saw the 1060's usage dip as a result. So if you look at the CPU comparison videos specifically, you'll see that our average frame rate doesn't really go up outside of an inherently CPU bound scenario like CSGO, for example. Where it does help is with frame rate consistency, which could potentially help in a multiplayer scenario, especially if you're lowering the settings to maximize frame rates, which could put you in a CPU bound situation. So no, more of the GPU won't really be used, and you won't get higher average frame rates outside of specific situations. It would mostly just improve your 1% and 0.1% lows. All right, so our next question is, how did you get on running those 5450s in Crossfire, and what drivers did you use? I'm getting crazy frame times. Now this is referring to a community post that I made as a joke. So I bought the system, and despite no GPUs being in the picture, it showed up with two 5450s installed for, I don't know, reasons. Like I said, that was a joke, so after I took that picture, I immediately pulled them and tossed them in my parts bin. I never ran it like that. And I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of multi-GPU outside of compute scenarios. And you're experiencing one of the reasons why. There's not a lot of compatibility, and so you can run into a lot of issues. You might only get one to work, the second one might work, but get very little usage. Games might not load, you can get crappy frame times, and any other number of issues. But it sure gets you kudos at the LAN party when you show up with two high-end GPUs installed but it can be super problematic from a functional standpoint. All right, so that's it for part one of this Q&A. Um, let me know what you guys thought down in the comments. Maybe we can expand this in the future depending on how y'all respond. I'll be uploading part two soon, but anyways, hope you found this useful. If you did, it'd be great if you did all the YouTube things. As always, thanks for all your continued support, and I'll catch you guys at the next video.